Good morning or good afternoon to everyone who has called into the webinar hosted at Said Business School. Uh, it's going to be an exciting 60 minutes talking about female CEOs and what brought them to their position, uh, any type of uh, trials and tribulations and the research that helped them get there. And we have uh, two wonderful, wonderful people sitting next to me right now um, who presented this research, put together, worked really hard on this. So we're going to start by introducing Andy. Well, I should actually just say I'm Christina parts Nebulous. I'll be, uh, I guess, emceeing, asking questions, uh, helping out with this whole webinar. Uh, our first speaker that we have is Andy Athanasopoulou, who is an assistant professor in organizational behavior at Queen Mary University of London and also an SBS associate, so SBS being Said Business School associate fellow. She also holds a PhD in MBA and an MSc, so a triple threat, and you have expertise in leadership, coaching, and ethics. And next, sitting right next to her is Michael Smets. He's an associate professor in management and organizational studies, also a fellow from a Green Templeton College, likes to row. I've seen him at the gym. Uh, he does also hold a PhD from Said, uh, and he focuses his research and well as teaching is a uh, solely around leadership development and management, uh, working with professional firms. And the two of them have known each other for 16 years. I just found this out now. So this is going to be a very uh, conversational tone. They went to school together and they have worked on this paper. And so again, this is a webinar. It's going to be 60 minutes roughly. I open the floor to any questions throughout the webinar. It wants to be relaxed or I want this to be relaxed, conversational. So if you guys have any questions, just type it in there and then I'll try to get to it as soon as possible. So again. Let's get to the theme of the entire webinar, which is focusing on what enables women to hold a CEO position. And I'm going to start with you, Michael, first. For this research, you didn't actually set out first to focus solely on women. There was, uh, how does this research come about? Yeah, so what we're focusing on today, the data from these 12 corporate CEOs, uh, is just a smaller part of a, of a much larger study. Uh, so we set out together with Heydrich and Struggles, the leadership uh, consulting company, uh, to understand what it takes to run a global corporation in the 21st century. Uh, so we interviewed over 150 corporate CEOs, 151 to be precise, 12 women, 139 men from around the world to see what does it take to uh, to lead a corporation. Um, now, what is quite distinctive about uh, the study is there is lots of research out there um, that surveys CEOs. But what we did is we actually sat face to face with these people for an average roughly an hour. Um, we granted them complete anonymity so that they could really share all the troubles and tribulations on the job, on the way, but also uh, the very personal solutions that they have found. So it's not necessarily about the generalizability of solutions, but about the very um, distinct insight that these people can bring. And as you can see from the stats on screen, um, these CEOs really lead big corporations. So the female CEOs in our sample on average have a tenure of about five years, and that is tenure as CEO of their corporation. They're responsible on average for $15 billion of revenue and 37,000 staff. So uh, um, they really have their, their hands full with, with big business, really. Did you guys struggle to, to get that many, the number of CEOs to to really just respond? Because I would, I would assume that it would be very difficult, especially if you're talking about these big guys that are dealing with $15 billion of revenue. Yeah, so we started out with a very big, long list. Uh, we pooled our own school alumni, the network of the school, uh, the relationships that Heidrich and Struggles could bring to the table. Um, and I think we started out with a, with a far, far larger sample, but we were very, very keen that the final sample, it had to be global okay. and it had to straddle all kinds of industries uh, because there's a lot of work out there that focuses on North American, Western European. So we were very keen to go out uh, to Asia, to Sub-Saharan Africa, to the Middle East oh, wow. and get perspectives from there as well. And, and of course, Andy and I have the privilege of sitting here today with you, but it, it was a far, far larger team, um, both here at the school, Andrew White, the Dean of Executive Education, our colleague Tim Morris, Amanda Cowan were part of that, and then a, a big team from, from Hydric and Struggles as well. So it was really a, a big team effort. And, and today we're just focusing on those those 12 female CEOs. Yeah, and, and that's the next question I want to get straight to right now is the fact that you just listed how difficult it was, how many people are involved, and yet you've got 12 women. That's it. Yeah. Why? I mean, it sounds like a small number, yeah. right? 
Well, if you look at the stats, actually, um, 9% of CEOs of or managing directors globally are women. So our 12 CEOs account for 8% of our sample. So it's really pretty consistent with what's happening out there. And it's really shocking to us. It was really shocking as well, looking at statistics to see how, how what a uh, small percentage that is. So the problem is there's a rarity of female CEOs and there are very few studies studying like mm -hmm. how these uh, female CEOs uh, manage to get where they are. Um, but this is al also like one, uh, the beauty of this study that we see um, it's one of the few opportunities to get insight into these highly successful women and see uh, how they view their success, how they develop themselves and what advice they, they give to other women. Um, so I think it's quite fascinating despite this being a very small sample. Yeah. And we can actually, let's dive into it and focus on uh, most of your research. We're going to be flipping through very few slides throughout this presentation for those that are looking through. So, because we don't want you to really focus too much on that, focus on what's being said right here. We're going to start, and I'm going to direct this back at you, Andy, again. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could just tell me, what did it take for these mm -hmm. women uh, to get to the top? I know it's a very general question, mm -hmm. but if you could start by just bringing in your research mm -hmm. uh, and explaining what they did. Mm -hmm. Actually, three words is self-acceptance, <laughs> self-development and self-management. And we're going to go through uh, this uh, right after. But very briefly, the idea is that very early in their career, it is when women start realizing that they actually have a leadership potential. And actually, that comes uh, to them much later than our male CEO suggested. Um, so the first thing they need to do, and these female CEOs did, was accept the fact that they have a leadership potential, they want to pursue such a career. Uh, so once they do that, then the next kind of process that uh, they have gone through is that of self-development. Again, we'll discuss about this uh, further. Um, so uh, the next one is that of self-management. So how they manage themselves, how they manage their careers. And we suggest that there are a number of things that organizations can do both at the personal level to help aspiring women um, to develop these three self-themes as we call them, but also at the policy level, there are a number of things that can be done. Um, so this kind of summarizes, and, and you can see the figure, these are the kind of three themes that really drive our research. Okay, and I'd like to actually start on the first one, self-acceptance. Self I feel like this is always brought up when you're talking about research around women, that they just don't accept that they deserve to be there or they don't think they're, they're good enough. And it seems to be a never-ending story. Can you just elaborate more on what you, what did you find with these 12 women in, within the self-acceptance category? It was actually quite interesting stumbling across this finding. As you say, it's it's very well known, but it was almost shocking to see how evident it was in the data. And there were two data points that really struck us. Um, the first one was we asked all CEOs, what's the defining moment of your leadership? And most of the men reached back into early childhood experiences, uh, captaining the school sports team, early experience in that way. And none of our female CEOs did. Um, either they didn't have those early leadership experiences or they didn't recognize themselves as being leaders. Invariably, all 12 female CEOs talked about leadership experiences at work. Um, and that is really testament to the, to the kind of gendered career um, propositions um, and, and how these questions very often start far earlier than, than in the workplace. So actually, uh, in response to advertising this webinar, uh, we've already been uh, contacted by a school what they can do to start uh, leadership development far earlier. Um, the second point then was how the female CEOs talked about this moment of realization that they had leadership potential. Um, and you listen to those um, interview recordings and it's almost like a, a coming out, uh, a diagnosis. They, they almost sound a little bit shocked and initially disheartened that I have leadership potential. And, and they really had to come to terms with the opportunities that arise from that, but also the different trade-offs. Wait, this is right. When you were interviewing, you you still heard that shock. Yes, you, you can still. After dealing with thousands and thousands of employees with the title, the office and uh, revenue and just, wow, I didn't expect that yes. at that point. That, that's, the, that's the great thing about doing these interviews that you really allow people to go back there. Uh, and they reflect very deeply and, and you can almost hear them going through that realization again. And it's like, and then I, I realize I have, I have leadership potential. 
Um, and that's why in the self-acceptance phase, we particularly focus on the need to, to take active ownership. Um, because there is the what we as academics call the, the neurotic imposter syndrome, that successful people in general, but stereotypically women especially, feel that they don't deserve the success they have. Um, I can't possibly be qualified enough for such a high profile job. Um, and then again, where stereotypical um, expectations enter the picture is that it is still, even though we're making progress, widely assumed that women lack the ambition that many men exhibit. Um, so on the one hand, due to the neurotic imposter syndrome, women don't necessarily self-promote. And male mentors or broader, more broadly, the organization doesn't assume that they're seeking leadership positions, so they don't get offered these opportunities either. Um, and that is why, as the very first step, accept that you have leadership potential, um, and that involves some very personal trade-offs, which everyone has to come to terms with individually. But unless you take active ownership, nothing happens. You cannot wait to be asked. You have to actively seek out the assignments that put you onto that trajectory. And that actually falls into the next step, too, when you're dealing with getting out there and building new networks. You can't be shy. You've got to ask people for help. And that falls into the second category. So, Andy, can you just tell me a little bit more about uh, self-development? Yeah, exactly. So uh, we find that self-development really emerges slightly later than self-acceptance, with self-acceptance being the kind of self, uh, the first theme. Uh, so self-development is about the processes of development in preparation for the CEO CEO role, but also once they are on the job, they keep on developing themselves, trying to find resources from the environment that will help them to, to further improve um, and become better leaders. Um, so we found that these women talk a lot about developing big picture capabilities, so strategizing, um, which is typically a skill that we find that men are better at, but uh, Despite this being what the literature says, we found that the women we studied really um, develop these skills and pay attention to that. They also uh, seek to develop networks. Now, there is an interesting variation from our data between what men said and, and what men typically do and what our female CEOs do. So women tend to develop networks with a view to build knowledge um, and to build human capital. So they try to identify networks that would help them to uh, share information, to learn and to help them become better leaders for the good of their organization and those um, that depend on them. Men tend to be more instrumental, so they tend to develop networks with a view to um, to gather political capital and further their career. So there's this interesting distinction uh, that we found with our uh, female CEOs. Uh, quite a few of them talked about being mentor and seeking mentors, uh, but really um, their conclusion was they would not expect someone to save them or sponsor them for a role. They, they would try to, to seek stretch assignments and improve. Um, and they, uh, quite a few of them said that actually they um, would not uh, want to be mentors themselves. And we have some research suggesting that women are not always as supportive to other women. So sometimes women have to you know, seek out these uh, networks uh, and do as much as they can on their own. So what we suggest um, is that women need to embrace a gynandrous leadership, uh, meaning that they still maintain their female leadership behavior and that has to do with being nurturing, being inclusive. So they do have that, but they complement that with the male behaviors of networking, of strategizing, but these are quite different than the typical male behaviors of networking that you would find um, among the male CEOs. So it's like treating leadership as a in genderless terms, essentially, yeah. even within the education system, all that, you just never he, she, never, oh, super masculine or nurturing, just mm -hmm. focus on genderless. Okay, that's really interesting. I actually want to just mm -hmm. follow up with yes. the networks. You talked mm -hmm. about building networks. Is there an importance about where those networks are built? Should it be within the organization or outside the organization? Well, they do both, so both within the organization, but also outside. So they seek out, for example, even at the CEO level, they seek out to um, to have contacts with other CEOs and share information, try to learn uh, from that um, new uh, the experience of uh, being in touch with them. So uh, there is an effort to really seek out information, but the, the critical difference between these female CEOs and the male ones, as I said, is the fact that they use that for the good of the organization. So it's less instrumental than men tend to be. 
And I just want to remind the listeners right now that you can ask questions whenever you want, and we'll try to slip them in uh, accordingly. So please feel free to join the conversation. Uh, Michael, I'm going to further this on to, uh, I guess, the next part of your research, which is uh, managing yourself, self-management. So you can elaborate. And you're seeing it on your screens right now at home, if you guys are listening on your computer, if you could just describe a little bit more details about this third part of being becoming a female CEO. So it's this need to to basically translate leadership as you self-manage in the position. And and self-development and self-management really go hand in hand as, as all our CEOs are very, very clear about the fact that um, you're maybe ready to be a CEO when you step into the position, but you're not really done. So you need to keep developing and you need to keep managing yourself going forwards. Um, and again, just to give you a little glimpse into the the analytic process, how we discussed this, discovered this need to translate leadership. We talked about building networks and different ways of networking. Um, and, and as a research team, we, we were very confident in the themes that we'd found and we just wanted to go back and double check. Um, and so we looked through the data and we looked for the word networking and it didn't appear, uh, not a single time. Which suggests to us that women simply talk about networking in a different language than male leaders do, than the leadership literature does. Um, and networking, it has a certain kind of baggage. It sounds a little bit instrumental, whereas the female leaders talk much more about building communities, striking up connections. They talk about networking in a different way. Um, and so that's really the linguistic aspect of translation. Um, and, and we call that, call for the, a new leadership lexicon. Because leadership, like strategy, when we think about where it comes from, it's the military. And so it's historically been masculine. Mm -hmm. uh, and the words that we have to talk about leadership mirror these more masculine leadership traits and behaviors. Can you give me an example? Um, again, it's, it's the way we talk about networking. And it describes the masculine way of networking. When we talk about this kind of blended forms of leadership, typically we talk about androgynous leadership, which putting Andrew first puts the men first. And, and it may seem very semantic or that we invent words like genandrous, but it is just critical that we develop a new language to allow women to put their femininity and their female leadership traits first and talk about it in a way that reflects that. The second point then is the more behavioral one that what we've seen a lot and we hear a lot about uh, female leaders adopting masculine leadership behaviors and being misunderstood as being bossy and things like that. And, and that is a, a behavior that doesn't translate, but simply adopts. Um, it, it tries to copy male behavior, which is in Congress for women to do. So it's a question about how can you translate leadership behaviors that you see in the workplace and make them their own. Translate them into your own work so that they're more congruent with your own personality, with your own leader, uh, value system, with your own approach to leadership. So it's a question of blending masculine and feminine rather than shifting from one to the other, which we've seen a lot in the past. I, okay, I feel like sometimes though people believe um, that there's a double standard when you're dealing with female leaders and male leaders and you're saying that a woman shouldn't be too aggressive or too pushy but yet put a man in that context and you're never going to say the same thing he's not going to come out across as you know queen bee or have all these problems but a woman if she's too aggressive oh she's being uh, a certain type of character or you know she's too pushy and so she's constantly have to having to balance it isn't that just so difficult to change because that's a mentality that's not even leadership words that's just literally people perceiving women in uh powerful positions and how they describe them and putting all these pressures on how they have to behave. Andy, do you think you can respond to that? Um, well, I mean, obviously the world is as it is, so women yeah. have to adjust uh, themselves and they have to kind of moderate the behavior. And it is indeed unfair that they have to make sure um, that they have to, to find a way that they are both assertive yet empathetic um, and yet feel comfortable with that. Um, so obviously they have to work 
more on that aspect than, than men. Um, and in fact, research suggests that me, when men tend to be more empathetic, they are not really appreciated as leaders if they try to use some of these softer skills. Yeah. So it's interesting how women are asked to, to combine and blend both uh, in a way that doesn't upset people. Uh, but this is how it is. And I think, you know, it, it needs to be, there it has to be some change at different levels. Um, and I think to some extent, it, it relates to how men are primed to be leaders and to be perceived as those that will take leadership roles very early in their life, whereas women tend to not have that priming from even at elementary school and, and their leadership potential is being recognized by themselves much later. So there's a matter of how, you know, at different levels, from school to the university to the work environment, um, the two genders are almost treated in, in different ways and given different mm -hmm. opportunities. Yeah, it's true. And I'd just like to uh, just respond to some of the questions that are coming in. Yes, this is being recorded, so you can go back and listen to it. Uh, there are Probably won't be a transcript, but you can listen to it, so that's a lot easier for us. Uh, we will have the slides put online as well so that you can reach out uh, to everybody here today. You can ask specific questions, and we're going to get to one specific question that I just saw uh, about networks. And uh, this is a question that you get all the time, especially uh, from younger students or younger people entering the workforce, how to build those networks. Um, do either of you, and maybe I can direct this at both of you, do you have any suggestions on what people can do to improve their networks? Because that's a major issue, especially if you're looking for role models. And and then you can talk specifically about female role models and how they sometimes don't want to help other females. So how do we build our networks? Let's start with you, Michael. I think it's it's important to understand what different networks can do for you. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, where do you want to build them? So we've heard earlier about that, that sometimes there's this, this queen bee syndrome yeah. that, that uh, female leaders in the organization are less inclined to, to help others. Um, or they simply don't want to be singled out as the uh, one of the, our uh, participants called it the uh, she didn't want to be the initiatives queen. Um, mm -hmm. You have very few female leaders at the top and, and they get kind of involved in, in any kind of uh, gender and diversity um, initiatives. And, and so if you want to avoid this kind of competitiveness, build your build your network outside um, and our CEOs find a variety of ways they, they connect with other executives through um, various activities. That's why they all go to the World Economic Forum where we presented this research because they can connect with others. But we also see from the 30% club to all kinds of initiatives, uh, women's roundtables that are industry specific, that are city specific, there is a lot going on. Um, one thing that we've heard where people are more cautious is about these female only networks inside organizations because the unintended consequence that has been uh, pointed out to us is that when that happens very often the men in the organization no longer see it as their issue um, it, it means like there is the, the women's club now so they are being looked after so it is no longer our problem um, so it makes sense to seek female only networks outside the organization take our women transforming leadership program for mm -hmm. example um, where you find this kind of safe space uh, to explore develop your own leadership style but inside of the organization build networks um, that help you do your current job but also help you think about moving up and, and getting your next job and that include both men and women um, because you still have to work with all of them. Uh, and there is this kind of mutual understanding um, and, and simply the relationships that come with this kind of networking. So think about more political networks on the outside, create a safe space for yourself to self-develop. On the inside, um, build more diverse networks across both men and women. And to be honest, also a lot of our female CEOs point out that they've very successfully been um, mentored by, by male role models. Um, it is not absolutely necessary that um, women only become successful if they have a female mentor and a female role model. It definitely helps, but that's not, not an exclusive relationship. Um, Andy, did you notice yeah. when you were speaking with some of these female CEOs, and this is a question coming from the mm -hmm. audience right now, um, did any of them have any issues with people not accepting that they were leaders because they were female? I know that's maybe possibly extreme, but did that ever happen? Um... I'm trying to think. We did have, I mean, they did express that there were some difficulties along the way, and sometimes they had to really seek out stretch assignments to push themselves to prove that they are able to do, 
you know, to manage more uh, uh, senior leadership positions. So uh, obviously there are these prejudices, but they've been actively seeking to, you know, don't let let this deter them from going for for more senior roles or uh, trying to bring themselves in difficult situations. Actually, we had one uh, female CEO saying it's good to go through hardship because it makes you uh, toughen up. Mm -hmm. You toughen up and then you become a better leader as a result. So well, it can be a positive thing. Yeah, right? yeah, no, it definitely can. And speaking of hardships, I'm just going to follow mm -hmm. up uh, directly at you. What about the work-life balance? This mm -hmm. is constantly a question that comes up mm -hmm. uh, regarding female CEOs. Should I assume that all these women had nannies? Like, how did they uh -huh. do it? Did they have children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about okay. that. Okay. Well, we did have like a few CEOs saying that they they work hard to make sure they also have a nanny. <laughs> they that can take care of their children. But uh, I think that your question relates very much to the self-acceptance uh, theme that we discussed earlier. And this is something that's happening early in women's, uh, in, in a female uh, leader's career. So they do recognize they have to make these trade-offs, the work-life balance, and they do recognize they have to take responsibility of whatever choices they make. However, um, and that kind of agrees with priorities as it has been done in that space that these trade-offs can actually be energizing so they do accept they have to make these trade-offs but but then again the work-life balance issues and having a successful career can be quite energizing as well um for these women and can have positive effects on the personal life um but it all comes back to making a conscious decision that, that there are some trade-offs to be made um but I think to, to a large extent, our female CEOs suggested, for example, when um, you know, they had to take uh, time off for childbearing reasons, um, that this was just a career break. It wasn't something that really was a barrier. So they have a different um, understanding of what a career means. And for them, uh, having like 20, 30, 40 years of career, just taking, slowing down for um, your career progress for, for a while is not that important. Men, on the other hand, were thinking that this is really um, a big barrier for women. And they suggested that women that do you know, have to, to step back and, and, and slow down their career because of um, the child Bearing years uh, that has been having like a really significant impact on mm -hmm. their progression. What about a spouse though? Because that was a specific question. So uh, what okay. role do they say? Are they all also well, big bosses or are they stay-at-home dads? Mm, it's mixed. So, so we do have quite a few um, women saying that they had uh, partners who were staying at home and taking care of the children. But we also have male CEOs saying that uh, you know they have um, women. Some of them all do have. Uh, uh, partners who are staying at home and, and uh, helping uh, with the child uh, bearing. Uh, however, um, they, quite a few of them had partners who were pretty successful leaders as well. So they had to find the balance between the two. I don't know if Michael mm -hmm. wants to add something. Right? Yeah. I think it, it, it ties this question to the previous one about um, do the female CEOs ever experience a situation where they're not being accepted? And, and, and let's be honest, we're telling the success story here. Mm -hmm. These women all made yeah. it to CEO sooner or later, they were accepted. But they talk about what it takes to get accepted and, and sometimes they have to work harder in that way. Um, and, and one uh, on, on the work-life balance uh, issue, one, one particular anecdote from an interview stands out to me mm -hmm. where we interviewed uh, well one of the, the male CEOs and um, he recalled in his kind of grand inaugural event where, where they had flown a large part of the organization to a very exclusive venue, hosted a big dinner in his honor. Uh, and he gave his speech and then said, well, I, I'm terribly sorry, I have to excuse myself uh, because I promised my daughter I would be around when she takes her driving test and that is tomorrow. So I have to jump on a plane right now. Um, and so men make these kind of trade-offs. They, 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 they sacrifice family time. However, when they prioritize family, um, they're almost like a saint. Uh, the CEO continued to say, like, I, I was really worried about being seen as uncommitted and not fit for the role. And he says, the next day, my inbox was overflowing with congratulations on what a great boss and family man I was. So when men are both tough, masculine and a family person, it's a standout quality. Whereas of women, that is more kind of taken for granted. That's just mm -hmm. what they do. So again, it's not a question of are these female CEOs accepted or not, but how hard do they have to work to get accepted because what is considered outstanding for a lot of the male CEOs 
is tragically still considered kind of a pass for the women and then we look for some spectacular performance beyond that there was a, a one listener who was slightly confused and you're talking about the traits of a female ceo um so what do they have they have to have a perfect mix of both the male attributes and the female attributes of being nurturing male being strong aggressive is that what you're saying mm -hmm. just so we can reiterate because i mm -hmm. think there was a little bit of confusion yeah. with one listener I'm, I'm not saying they need a they need a perfect mix well they, i know perfection yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but but they need a personal mix okay uh, they need a mix that fits them uh, and i think what and, and also, let's be clear, when we analyze these interviews, they're actually anonymous. When we read them, we don't know whether we're reading the statements of a man or a woman. We only find out later after the analysis. And I will admit, there were some interview transcripts that I read where I thought to myself, oh, well, the kind of macho alpha male corporate leaders still exist, only to find out that it was a woman. Um, and that's also, I have to say, a, a personal problem for me that we do talk about men and women in, in very stereotypical ways. Mm -hmm. And there are female leaders out there who are just naturally in their natural demeanor, um, more assertive, and it comes natural to them. And, and so they can, they can just run with it. And that's great. The problem comes when you simply try to copy a behavior that you have witnessed as successful in somebody else. And especially if female leaders simply copy behaviors they've seen as successful in male behaviors because others then perceive that as incongruous, disingenuous, fake. And it simply takes a lot of energy to maintain both of these personas, your own authentic self and this kind of leadership persona you're projecting to the outside. So it's not about a perfect blend, but it's about finding a very personal blend that builds on your own personal, in this case, female leadership traits and doesn't try to kind of turn yourself inside out and become a, a man first and foremost, and then a, a female leader second. That just doesn't work. So I guess fake it till you make it. It doesn't really work in this context, but it's, <laughs> it's just something you often hear. But I, I'm going to actually move this conversation on just Andy. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what the men have to say, because you had 151 male CEOs and mm -hmm. their thoughts in regards to female leaders and mm -hmm what they've seen in their experience. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, we touched upon uh, that a bit earlier, but, but the idea is that they were uh, very aware of the trade-offs. They too recognize that women have to make uh, these decisions and that the majority of household tasks and childcare responsibilities fall on women. Um, so the attitude was similar in the sense that they too stressed that there are sacrifices that must be made. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, men say that um, Childbearing is an obstacle for a woman's career, um, and missing out on stretch assignment will have really an impact on the, the opportunities they will have later on when they come back to the workforce full time. Whereas women say that it's just a short break, so literally within a long career, just taking some time off or slowing down your progress just for a few years didn't have like any substantial negative effect on their career. They still got there where they wanted to get. Um, so there is a, this is the, 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 the critical distinction between how men and women perceive you know, uh, the, the opportunities or the, the barriers that women have in terms of um, their development early in their career. It, it strikes me because there was one actual quote from a CEO that, in mm -hmm. your paper that said that uh, maybe women, sh and this is coming from a man, mm -hmm. maybe women shouldn't have children between the ages of 25 to 30, which I thought was, uh, you know, interesting coming from a man. But uh, besides the point, I actually want to follow up with yes. that, just talking about these CEOs, they got there. They got to the position even though they've had children. What about their salaries? Because this is a question that um, one mm -hmm. of the listeners is asking just mm -hmm. in terms of compensation. Was there, did they notice a difference regarding what they were getting paid or uh, maybe after they had children, maybe they weren't CEOs just yet, but was there any talk about that? Um, we did have, uh, we don't have any data on that. Um, however, speaking of salaries, there's something, it's not from our research, but it's something from other research in that space, which I think is quite interesting and I want to uh, bring forward. So um, there has been, there have been studies looking at uh, whether the salaries of male and female subordinates change when they swap and they get, uh, they used to have a male a leader. Um, and they have a female leader, like a year later, they have a female leader. Well, male uh, um, subordinate salaries remain the same or increase when they get a female uh, leader. When women, female subordinates, get a female leader, the salaries go down. 
So that suggests that women actually don't always help other women. And I mean, did anybody comment on that with the CEOs, um, the female CEOs, that they've had trouble with women in their office? And not really, but they did say that I've worked hard to get where they are and expect all the other people to work as hard as I am. So there might be something around, you know, them being female leaders, they had to make sacrifice and work hard. So they expect the same of their female subordinates. So I don't know if that answers your... Yeah, yeah, because I think it's a constant uh, problem Mm -hmm. and just within any field almost that women just sometimes don't want to help other women. Yeah, they are actually, women say that women are the least preferred leader for them. So they prefer to have a male leader um, instead of of the female one. And we've all had like, I used to work in banking and, you know, the least nice, nice bosses were, were the female ones. Uh, I think you said you, you had the experience too. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely experienced that in the television world. But it, it, we were talking about this um, just prior to this webinar about um, women and just how difficult sometimes it is to work with them. But um, do you think that this is something that needs to change. I, I want to bring it back to like what we need to do to change this, the training mm-hmm. programs, mm-hmm. women being not as nice to other women. Mm-hmm. How can we begin to even change that mentality? Or is it always going to be these CEOs? I fought to the top. Therefore, you need to respect me no matter what. And I'm going to be aggressive and especially hard on other women because I worked so hard. So either of you can re- respond to that if you want. Yeah. I think... While some of the things that these female CEOs still say still sound a bit disillusioning, we might hope that the world has has moved on further than that. Um, They are still very aware that the world has moved on. There are more female leaders around now. There are more uh, women to network with to get these kind of um, support. And and here in this webinar, obviously, we, we very much focused on what female leadership candidates can do. So they don't have to rely on themselves. And and I know it all sounds like oh the uh, the onus is all on, on women to make it work and, and make it happen for themselves. Um, but of course, we, we also and especially in, in the paper that we published and I've seen people ask about it. There, there is a copy available on, on, our, on our website. Um, we actually talk very clearly about what. Um, support can HR practices um, and others in the organization give both at a very personal level. So how do you support that active ownership of careers? How do you help people individually build new networks and and support their leadership translations? But also how can we help at a more institutional level? But I think what what we're really trying to say by bringing this together is that the world hasn't quite reached the point yet, sadly, where Female leadership candidates can just rely on their environment, picking them up and and nurturing them. The kind of uh, initial spark still needs to come for them. So the onus still is on women in the sense that they have to take active ownership. Mm -hmm. But around that, there is now an increasingly um, resilient infrastructure to help them en route to the top. So it's not all at the individual level. There's a lot happening at the institutional level. Um, but it has to happen in the dialogue between that. Um, you, institutional, you mean within the these organizations, HR programs? Are we are we talking even before that? It, you know, at the education, uh, high school, college degrees, Said business schools. Yeah. Should there be a different way of teaching women here? Well, I mean, I think it applies at every level, from elementary school, from the elementary school to the university, um, and you know, for example, here. We are using, I know Michael is using some of that material um, in his uh, postgraduate teaching. I'm using some of that material in, okay. in women transforming leadership. So there is an effort to use more of that research and and really, you know, voice the importance of, of, of really uh, paying more attention to these things. But I um, also wanted to add, and now, uh, like over the last year, I think there have been so many changes in terms of public opinion how how much we talk about gender issues so we have the me too movement um we have the bbc gender pay gap which is a big issue over the last few months so i think there's there are more discussions in that space and i think that might be the spark that that michael mentioned that things might start changing from now on in in a speedier way than before Well, if you're saying things are changing, this actually can fall into a question from one of our listeners who says, how much of this is a generational problem? Because you're saying now we're bringing up gender pay, Me Too, Time's Up, all of these issues. 
but these leaders are a little bit older, these 12 women. So is it a generational problem? And the listener continues by saying, many people at the top still have traditional ideas about gender roles. Will it get easier as younger men and women now progress in their careers? So that spark, do you think it's going to mean that, you know, there'll be more women in the future in CEO positions, Michael? Um, hopefully, yes. Um, there are definitely, there's an increasing number um, of, of women on these leadership trajectories. You look at our current um, MBA cohort, it's 41% women. We would still like to have more um, in class, but but there are a lot, lot of things um, happening um, alongside that where there is more momentum building in, uh, in organizations, more opportunities for networking, more opportunity for, for shared experience, um, because I think that's really what a lot of the female CEOs in our study um, experienced, that they were kind of the, the trailblazer. Um, there had not been a, a female senior leader of their caliber before, so they had to break down all these walls and break through the glass ceiling themselves. But now, in many organizations, someone has already done that. Um, and I think what we should probably also point out, and what I... Uh, failed to mention earlier in this dialogue between the organizational, the institutional, and the individual, is, is also individual men, uh, both in organizations and at home, um, and what they can do. And uh, you quoted earlier uh, a male CEO declaring uh, the age at which women should or should not have babies. Maybe it would just be a good idea to, to listen to how women experience work, family, their career plan, and as we've pointed out, support the long game, which is how the female CEOs talked about, give us the opportunity to raise our families as and when we like and build the organization around us rather than presuming that the organization kind of runs on a male biorhythm when the workforce is increasingly female. So maybe just listen a bit more and, and talk a bit less sometimes. <laughs> Uh, Andy, in yes. the research, and it's we're gonna since we're talking about men, uh, in the research there was a section um, where you had spoken to a CEO, well, one of the interviews that you had with a male CEO, um, and he said that, or overall, about only one tenth of the male CEOs would give the same advice to women as they would men. That struck me as quite a statistic that these men wouldn't give the same advice to females that want to climb up the ladder. Why is that? Well, they do recognize that women um, do face, um, you know, a certain barriers. So they have to overcome those. So um, in that sense, they have to have a, a kind of separate set of a separate list of uh, uh, of uh, um, a piece of advice that they that could be given. So I think that kind of reflects how um, um, this issue is being perpetuated. So we still keep on uh, treating women as a, pop a, a segment of the population that needs to be treated in a different way and be given different uh, types of advice. Um, and that has to do with the difficulties that exist in the context. But also, I think the problem is just the fact that we treat them as needing a separate set of um, uh, piece of advice. advice that. Right. So yeah. then that's creating that yeah, divide, that, that gender divide. divide, which you guys are really yeah. pushing to change that mm -hmm. within it's, your research. Yeah, and it's the kind of, as Michael mentioned, the kind of language we use. And even when we were writing this paper, we keep kept on, you know, using this gender uh, terms in order to kind of help us understand what's happening. And I think that is something that needs to be addressed. Address. So how does research really, uh, what kind of terms are being used? That's why we suggested Jane Landers. Mm -hmm. so try to think, uh, you know, in a different way about how we approach um, this issue and how we term the phenomenon of female leadership. Within the research and all these women that you, you spoke to, and this again is a, a listener question, mm -hmm. um, Michael, was there a common thread between these 12 women, maybe in their history, did they all get uh, undergraduate business degrees or MBAs or, you know, did they all play a certain a sports or anything? Was there any type of commonality um, within these 12 women? And there was an interesting commonality um, across all the CEOs because at, at that level, Many of them have enjoyed very similar kinds of education. Um, they consume the same kind of sources of information. So we ask them, how do you prepare for uncertainty and change? And they all read the Harvard Business Review and the Financial Times and The Economist and The Wall Street Journal. Uh, they've all been 
to, to MBA programs or executive education programs at uh, top schools around the world. So even the, the kind of, because I think I spotted the second question around that about regional differences, even the regional differences weren't so pronounced. There seems to almost be like a, a class of, of global CEO that is quite homogeneous in that way. So, so I think that's an interesting other point to, to consider in terms of who is, who is similar, who is different. So no, they weren't different um, in that way. There is a common plot in terms of these three stages, all of which it takes, this moment of self-acceptance uh, and this decision to take active ownership of their career to develop and to self-manage. However, within that, there is an incredible amount of variety. Um, some of these female CEOs were self-made entrepreneurs. Um, they started their companies uh, in their early 20s. Um, some of them got to the business world relatively late. Um, some of them only discovered that, yes, they really wanted to rise to a leadership position after they had raised their family. So they, they came to that, to that game relatively late. And they say with some credibility and confidence, didn't really do that much harm. As I remember one of them saying, look, in a, in a career that's actually ever longer these days, mm -hmm. our work lives expand, in a career over 30, 35, 40 years, what's a five-year break? Yeah, true. Um, it, regarding your research, Andy, you guys, both of you, focused on 12 women who are already at the top. Mm -hmm. What about the steps it takes to get to the top? What about researching uh, that? How, what's the plan for that? Well, um, I think it's quite important um, early in their career for women to have the opportunities as uh, we mentioned earlier, to develop networks, but also to educate themselves and, and develop the, their leadership uh, skills. So um, as part of that, you know, doing a postgraduate degree, an MBA or an executive education program where they have that opportunity is quite important. And this kind of ties with the research, the new research project that we've uh, recently started with Michael and another professor, Sue Dobson, um, uh, from here at the business school. And we're looking at um, how um, female CEOs um, who are not st uh, how female leaders who are not yet CEOs most of them These are um, managers even, uh, or yeah VPs? they're a mid to senior level managers okay. very few of them are CEOs but uh, we are trying to understand what is their leadership journey um, and both in terms of those who are in senior positions but also those who are on the journey who are not still there um we are trying to understand also what could be the career accelerating development interventions that uh, could be applied to help them to to improve their the progress uh, um on the career ladder um and also what kind of leadership practices these women embrace and what are the things that really work well for them um, so we've started a, a very exciting research project in that space and if any of our listeners are interested to participate we would very much welcome um you know and they should get in touch uh, with us in the email address we have on screen now um yeah and well, this is you're still going on. This just started, so this is going yeah, to be a yeah. There is potential like for people who that may want to participate. Oh, so this is it's, great it's, for it's the listeners exact. that are in any type of roles or know any female managers, uh, senior level managers, uh, can definitely reach out to the email on your screen because it'd be great to get more people. And we do have some more questions uh, from the audience that we're going to get to in just a second. But um, I think there was confusion by one person uh, earlier on that was talking about self acceptance and how can some people. Are, just struggle with this. And this is a, uh, a personal thing. And just accepting that you are good enough, that you can do this, putting yourself out there, uh, fearing, not fearing rejection. What advice do you have to both men and women that are listening for that? Well, I think uh, one of the things I, I would strongly advise, and that relates to some of my other research, is to uh, have the opportunity, whether with the help of the organization or on their own, to have a coach. Um, that really will help them to understand, you know, what are their strengths, how they can improve themselves and how they can accept those, themselves um, for what they want to, to achieve in their career. So I think if you try to have this kind of interventions early on in your career or having, you know, participating in an executive a development a program or a, a studying, as I said, a degree that can really um, make you uh, 
more better equipped uh, to understand yourself and what are the skills that you can really further develop that relate to your leadership potential. So I think it's quite important to really be exposed to um, an environment where that helps you to understand um, what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and try to uh, address them. Okay. Um, Michael, this question came up before, but I think uh, somebody else has now mentioned it again, uh, just in different words. So I want to bring it up again. Did the women CEOs, the 12 women that you spoke to, at any point once they became CEO, did they feel isolated at all? Did they ever talk about that? I think that is quite difficult to tease apart because all CEOs feel lonely at the top. Right. That's something everybody says. It's very lonely at the top. Um, again, that's why, I mean, the, the networking issue is, is not, again, exclusive to women. The men also seek networks um, to find support, to find validation, uh, to work through the insecurities that the, the job brings. Um, but again, some of these things are, are quite mundane, and it, it comes down to the fact, how do organizations socialize, for example? Um, do you go for drinks? Do you go to the pub? Do you do corporate sports? Um, and, and it's a simply a matter of, of numbers. Men will find more men to socialize with and, and uh, engage in, in shared activities in a way. And simply because if there are few women around, there are fewer women around to build networks with, socialize with. Uh, and, and so even though the women aren't more explicit about that, about being lonely at the top, the numbers would suggest that there must at least be a kind of a, a kind of predisposition for that. Was the research uh, that was, you both conducted was it in male dominant societies? This is just a, I know it's a particular question, but was there any trend towards that? Oh well, we had from all continents data from all continents, both for our female CEOs and and the, the largest sample. So no, no, no. <laughs> Um, there's one listener that wants you to go back to uh, the three, if you can go two slides back, and we're just going to, uh, who seems to just want an, a little bit more information on this. So if you could, Michael, recap in one sentence each for each of these, uh, and this will slowly bring our webinar to an end, but if you can just recap on uh, what you found <clears throat> women need to do to get to become, uh, or to become a CEO. So the, the key focus, and that's really the main focus for today, is this kind of self-work women have to do and the three stages of self-acceptance, self-development and self-management and, and what it takes at each stage. And so self-acceptance clearly is about taking active ownership, um, as one of them uh, put it, don't wait to be asked. Um, and taking active ownership means overcoming those insecurities um, thinking that you're good enough, reassuring yourself that you're good enough, um, and then not necessarily um, copying masculine leadership behaviors, but really developing your own and having the confidence to base your leadership style around your uh, genuine feminine self. And that's why we insist on this concept of genandrous rather than androgynous leadership, so that female leaders don't have the, the sense that they need to turn themselves inside out and turn into men, uh, but rather translate their leadership so they don't copy it, but find their own and, and fashion their own way of doing that. And then along the top and the, and the bottom, we say, look, even though the development needs to start with this moment of self-acceptance and, and women need to provide the spark to their leadership career, there is uh, support that can be given at both a personal level, running across the top, supporting active ownership, building new networks, supporting leadership translations, but also at a more organizational or, or institutional level, like, for example, the World Economic Forum does, uh, that we support the long game as in offering more flexible long-term career trajectories um, that are more um, commensurable with raising a family, institutionalizing this genandrous leadership. And, and that finally means drafting a new leadership lexicon, giving us a language to talk about new ways of leadership that female leaders develop over time. Okay. And just to just probably bring it together, Andy, can you just tell me what you found to be one of the most insightful things throughout this research? And just if you can also follow up too with any advice to give to women and men that are listening? 
So I think working with yourself around these three themes helps you to become a better leader, but also improves how um, your interaction with those around you. And while it makes it takes a lot of effort, uh, or it might seem as it, uh, that it does, um, it really is trying to to have that drive to improve yourself at every step and and really um, understand that there are other women out there who have managed, who have succeeded. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, however hard it might seem for those women who are early in their career and they might be facing some of these barriers, they should take heart. There are other women who have gone through the same things they've managed to, to succeed. Um, and. Would we well, if we any of you both for final words regarding this research, so you do have some more research coming out, but overall, uh, there's a lot of work went into this, a lot of work, a lot of long hours, uh, definitely speaking to a lot of CEOs. Uh, is there any final words that you want to leave uh, to our listeners tonight, Michael, and then followed by Andy just regarding this research? Words of encouragement, maybe, that they too can do it. Oh, I think, and, and, and I think that's the funny thing, um, that I think female leaders should go out there with a lot more confidence because one other thing that is also being said and especially by the male CEOs in our sample is the future of leadership is female because they realize that this is not just a gender issue, this is an issue of good leadership and even the male uh, CEOs in the sample are very, very clear that it's not just about female leaders who need to toughen up and develop a bigger vision and become more strategic but the men need to be more empathetic, they need to be more nurturing, and that means in the end, we end up with a leadership cadre who are just better, more rounded people who bring more of themselves to work. Uh, and I think that's a great thing we, we can look forward to. Do you want to add on to that? Or? Well, I very much agree that the, the research suggests that, you know, these female, uh, female leaders tend to, to be more rounded and better leaders because they also have this empathy. So. So, which is quite important. So uh, it helps, uh, it makes others be motivated, inspired by them. So I think we should think of that, these 12 female CEOs as a good example of women that succeeded and are role models for the younger generations um, and the, female, the aspiring female leaders and future CEOs. Well, I want to say thank you very much. I'm going to just bring it back to uh, in a, a slide. We're going to bring it back to the slides with everybody's bio on it, actually, so you can see who you're ta listening to, how you can reach out. Um, all of the information from today's webinar will be sent to you. There's going to be a recording that's sent and a link to your research so that all our listeners can find out more. Because I know that there was a lot of questions, specifics about how can I be a better communicator? Which books should I read to become a better leader? I think they should just come to Said Business School and they can find out, right? Because you both are fellows here. But um, we will send all that information out. And you two are relatively easily accessible via yes. email and sure. online. Social media. Yeah, social media. Yes. So should anybody listen? listening want to reach out the names are on your screen there uh, you can reply back to the email with the link uh, to get any information regarding this webinar I hope we answered some of your questions Andy and Michael thank you so much for joining me congratulations on this research and good luck uh, with the next step thank you Christine. thank you guys thank you very much